Well, uh, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine was involved in a college ministry at the local community college down in Longview. And she told a story about a, a surprising conflict she had with another student leader. She had accidentally booked a room for her group to meet at the same time that another group was uh, supposed to meet. She got there early and she set up and the other group leader came and proceeded to respond in a very disproportionately angry way. <laughs> she apologized for the oversight, it was just a simple mistake, and said, let's try and figure something out. And uh, this other student leader said to her, yeah, we don't really believe in second chances around here. Wow. <laughs> pretty pretty, pretty uh, edgy little comment there, came in pretty hot, uh, and she was just startled by this, and I still remember the story to this day, it just caught me off guard, uh, what a surprising response, right? And as she reflected on that experience, uh, she said that we really do take grace for granted, you don't realize how beautiful grace is until you're in those moments where there is no grace. You know, I think uh, this little snapshot of a small little event that happened on a college campus is in many ways a representative of a, a larger troubling trend that seems to be gaining ground in our culture right now. It seems that more and more, friends, uh, our world is short on grace. Our world is short on extending second chances. And if you spend time on social media, you could probably point out numerous examples every week of this happening, right? When a celebrity or a public figure makes a mistake or says something they regret, our world is quick to try and eviscerate and cancel that person. Not a whole lot of grace, not many second chances. And, and this has really started to infect our social dialogue right now. Instead of generous listening, we now prioritize ideological purity, right? Rather than giving a generous interpretation of our other uh, a person's comments, we try and denounce it and destroy our opponents with our argument. And as we see this taking root in our culture, I think it's starting to filter into our churches and our conversations. I think it also begins to filter into our internal dialogue. The uh, National Science Foundation came out with a poll recently that discovered that 80% of our internal dialogue, the things we say to ourselves, is negative. And so we're pretty short on grace towards ourselves, are we not? All right. Well, we preach a, a message of grace, I think we're often proclaiming to ourselves a message of self-condemnation. Friends, there's not a whole lot of grace in our world. There aren't many second chances, and that's why I believe this word from Jonah 3 comes as good news to us. It breaks through that oppressive environment with a word of grace. We discover that God has grace both for Jonah and for the people that he is struggling to love. This story begins with a second chance. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh. This verse is almost verbatim from Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. And when I was first reading this, I just kind of glossed over this line and got onto the real drama, but I just want to pause here for a moment and notice the grace in this opening line. Jonah has run from the Lord, he has rebelled from his calling, he's made a mess of his life and the lives of those around him, and yet God calls out to him a second time and says, arise, go to Nineveh. We see here this gracious second chance, a God who is not done with Jonah. Notice that God does not remind Jonah of his past failures. He doesn't remind him of the promise he made in Jonah 1 verse 9. Uh, he doesn't talk about how it was so great that he saved him. Remember how I saved you from that whale? No, just with a, a simple, humble, gracious word. He says, arise, Jonah, and go. And I wonder if we maybe just need to pause here for a moment and hear this word of grace. Can we hear this good news that God sees you and he, and he sees you in some of the failures and your regrets and your mistakes and he invites you to arise from that 
and go into a new chapter, into a new season of discipleship, a new season of ministry. We, friends, have a God of second chances, a God of multiple chances who does not want to allow our past to define us. God is not done with Jonah. God extends grace to Jonah. Maybe that's some good news that we just need to hear today. But as the story continues, we discover that God is also not done with Jonah's enemies. He extends grace to the Ninevites. Now, we mentioned this a few weeks ago, that this is a surprising detail in the story of Jonah. The Ninevites were the arch enemies of the Israelites, and they were a brutal people. Archaeologists, archaeologists have discovered some of the artwork of the Assyrian Empire, and they really celebrated violence and torture. This was like a well-equipped terrorist regime. And when we understand that, we can start to have some more empathy for Jonah, why he's reluctant to go and proclaim a word to them. He's nervous that God's actually going to forgive his enemies. There are a lot of wounds, there's a lot of trauma, a lot of pain that's been inflicted upon him and his people from the Assyrians. And so it's even more surprising that God is not done with these people. And a closer reading of the Hebrew language reveals some things about the heart that God has for Jonah's enemies. There's an interesting translation that's missed in the English, but in verse 3, some of our English translation says that Nineveh was a city of great importance, but in the Hebrew, it actually says that Nineveh was a great city to Elohim, which is a word for God. And what's being communicated here by the narrator is that Nineveh is important to God. Nineveh is a great city to God. God actually still cares about these people. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. But I want us to notice something really interesting about this word, overturned or destroyed. It's this Hebrew word, hapak. And there's actually a dual meaning here. And a close reader of the narrative is going to pick up here on what God is trying to communicate. So the word hapak can mean destroyed. And it shows up in the Hebrew Bible in the context where God proclaims judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. He brings hapak, this destruction upon the people. But it also is a word that means to transform or change. It has this dual meaning. And so, for example, in Psalm 30, we read, You hapak, you changed my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Psalm 30 is a psalm of repentance, and the Ninevites, in many ways, embody the practices of Psalm 30. They put on sackcloth, they fast, they repent, and through that, God does not destroy, he doesn't overturn, but he transforms and changes. And so a number of commentators just point out that there's some intentional play on words going on here. Some people even think that God might have even been tricking Jonah a little bit. Jonah would have been ready to say, 40 days and you will be destroyed. <laughs> but as we see the story unfold, we discover that God actually desires not destruction, but transformation. That God has a, a, a deeper desire. He ultimately wants to see these people changed. Now, God is rightly angry at the violence and the terror of the Ninevite people. I think sometimes we are troubled by these languages of the fierce anger of God, and we like the passages about God's love and these passages that talk about God's anger and wrath towards evil. We're like, ah, oh, that feels a little uncomfortable. But can I just uh, suggest to you that there is actually deep love being expressed in God's anger at evil and violence? If God looked upon our world as it is today, filled with innocent people being bombed, of child abuse, of human trafficking and injustice, it would not be loving for God to say, oh well, let's live and let live, right? No judgment here. 
I think we've lost sight of that, that, that wrath actually is an expression of God's love. If God didn't love, he'd just ignore the whole situation altogether, but he sees the problem of violence. He sees the problem of evil. He, he notices that innocent people are caught in the crossfire of this violence, and so he is, is concerned, and he wants to confront the Ninevites. There is love in this word, and there are consequences when we persist in evil. God has so designed this world in such a way that when we persist in this way, it will overturn us eventually. It will not be sustainable. There are are troubling consequences when we go down this path of continued violence. But let us preserve the, the truth of the scriptures that God's ultimate desire is that they would not be destroyed, but that they would be transformed. That God can't leave them in this place, but his desire is that they would turn and live, turn away from these ways of evil. This shows up so often in the prophets, and when you read the prophets, it's pretty intense at times. Uh, The prophets kind of come on pretty strong. They say some hard things. There's a moment in Ezekiel 33, and this shows up a couple times, where the prophet kind of pauses for a moment. He says, I know I've been coming on pretty strong. Okay, I've been, I've been talking about judgment and calling you to return, to, to turn away. And there's this pause in Ezekiel 33. It's a really important verse to me, where God pauses and says through the prophet, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their evil ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? The prophets regularly just pause in the midst of these hard words and say, just as a reminder, like, I, I don't want you to be destroyed. <laughs> I desire that you would turn and live. Why persist in these ways? And so, in light of this understanding of the Hebrew language here and what we see in the narrative, can we discover again this, this picture of a God who has a heart for the Ninevites? He desires that they would have hak, that they would be changed, that they would be transformed. And I just wonder if this dual meaning of this word might shape our posture towards culture right now. And I wonder if, if you might just imagine that a someone or a group of people that you are struggling to love right now. Maybe there's a segment of culture that you are angry towards, and maybe there's some righteous anger. We're frustrated with people that are acting in certain ways that we see as destructive. And I just wonder, do we desire that they be transformed or destroyed? Do we continue to hold on this hope that, that they would thrive, that God would, God's best would come into their life? I think we've been so discipled and shaped by our cultural values right now that, that we are learning to have uh, just a posture of, of antagonism towards our enemies. We actually want to just slam dunk on them on social media. We want to set up a lawn chair and just watch them get destroyed. And God's saying, no, the, the heart that I want you to have for the world around you, for, for this culture around you, is a heart of concern, a heart of love. Can we have that shift where we we don't desire the destruction of our world, but the transformation of the world? Can we remember again that God does not hate the world, but he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life? Can we discover again that those people that we're struggling to love are very important to God? They are important to Elohim, to God. This is what God is trying to teach Jonah. That's actually the purpose of this book, is trying to shift Jonah's heart, his posture towards his enemies, towards culture, and it's slow going. Jonah is still a work in progress. So we've seen some turning And we noted that in the beginning of our passage. Jonah now arises, he goes, and that's commendable. This was a difficult call. I was contemplating just the challenge that Jonah was given. He's going to a people that hate him, that uh, want him to die, that have hurt him. And I was thinking about how I got a pretty cush job. I get to go to a church that gives me like a a thank you basket today. Thank you, by the way. It was like there's an appreciation basket some of you made. 
and, uh, and there's like a place where most, you know, we're kind of for each other, and, and even I sometimes am like, this is hard, right? So imagine Jonah <laughs> responding to God's call, and he's going to a place where people aren't for him. This is a hard calling, and so we see some shift, and he's turning towards God, and yet the text as it continues suggests that he's still a little bit on the fence. <laughs> there is some deeper surrender, some deeper transformation needing, needed in his heart. And so the narrator gives us some clues that Jonah's kind of on the fence. He's kind of half in in this call to go to Nineveh. There's something that's interesting in the Hebrew language in verse 3 and 4. Now, Nineveh was a great city to Elohim. And then notice this, a walking of three days, and Jonah began to go into the city a walking of one day. Now, the English translations clean it up because that's awkward English, but that's the literal translation. He goes into Nineveh, a walking of three days, and Jonah began to go into the city, a walking of one day. Now, we've noticed that the writer of Jonah does not spare any words. There's a lot of intentionality in this narrative, and there's something being communicated here. For Jonah to complete this message, it would take him three days to walk through Nineveh to all the key parts of the city, and yet we see that he cuts his mission trip short, it looks like. (laughs) While God calls him to walk three days, he just walks one day. And so there's just this wondering, is he he really into this? Is he just kind of starting to step into culture but holding back a little bit? And then we hear this sermon, and and when you unpack this sermon, it's, it's not a very good one. It's a, a five-word sermon. In Forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. There's no mention of Yahweh. There's no call to repentance. There's no application of what they should do. <laughs> and so even in the sermon, we get the sense that Jonah's kind of, there's more conversion needed, right? And next week, we'll see that that is the case. He's still tr- struggling to love his enemies. This hapak, this transformation in Jonah's life is going to take a while, as it sometimes does, right? The hope in this is that, that God is still able to work through Jonah, God is able to use Jonah, even in his mixed motives and his brokenness and his reluctance. God somehow takes this mediocre sermon and he changes a nation. And this gives me such great hope as a preacher. (laughs) I could preach a mediocre sermon, but may the Spirit do the Spirit's work among us. You know, thanks be to God. God can be at work, even in our limitations. And sometimes I think we just need to step out, even in our in-between Uh, our brokenness and not wait till we have it everything figured out before God can use us but as we step out we grow and we change and God uses Jonah there's a man named uh, Kasuke Koyama and he's a well-known prominent Japanese Christian and theologian and in one of his books he dedicates it to a missionary named Herbert Brand quote through whose preaching in broken Japanese my grandfather was converted to Jesus Christ. And I just love that story that God can take someone can take our broken speech our in process realities and somehow use us to to bring a message to this world. There's, there's a lot of grace in this. There's a lot of hope in this. And indeed as Jonah proclaims this five-word sermon to the surprise of the readers. The Ninevites change. They are not destroyed. They are transformed. They are not overturned. They are turned over into a new season, a new chapter of life. Ironically, in this text, the Ninevites proceed to act like model Israelites. They're doing all the right things. I think this is the point of this book. It's kind of flipping everything on its head. The the prophet appointed by God, who is in covenant with God, who knows Yahweh, is slow to turn. And the Ninevites, who know nothing about God, are quick to turn. And so it says that they acknowledge their evil. They repent, they fast, and they put on sackcloth and ashes. Now, this is an interesting detail because when you explore Assyrian spirituality and religion. This was not an Assyrian practice. And uh, so Craig Keener in his background commentary points out that they are practicing Israelite spirituality. They're practicing Psalm 30. And this is communicating something significant to the reader. See, they're doing it right. right. And then we notice that the king of Nineveh becomes this mediator. He says, let us turn from our evil ways 
and perhaps God will relent. Now we've known Up, that the Lord relented and not bring disaster on his people. That's right after the Israelites make a golden calf and the turn from the Lord. The same language shows up in Jeremiah 26, where the, perhaps they will listen and each turn from his evil way, then I will relent and not bring on them the disaster I had intended. This is verbatim from what we see the king of Nineveh saying in Jonah 3. What's the point of all this except for just being really cool? What's happening, what the writer of Jonah is doing is, is flipping everything on its head to make a point. Uh, th- this is kind of the irony. In both the stories of Moses and Jeremiah, this is Tim Mackey, the prophet plays the role of mediator. The irony is that Jonah, in our story, unlike Moses and Jeremiah, has abdicated his role as prophetic mediator, yet unlike the Jerusalemites, the Ninevites do repent. Right? So there's this just complete flip on expectations. And I think what's happening here, what the purpose of the book of Jonah is, is to hold up a mirror to us as the people of God. To hold up a mirror to us and invite us to reflect on where we need hapak, transformation, and change. I think we are shaped to have this default of seeing the speck in the eye of culture, and this book invites us to look at the log in our own eyes and discovered the way God wants to reshape our heart towards the world, where there's deeper change needed in our life. You see, this is actually how Jesus preaches the book of Jonah. In Matthew 12, the Pharisees are pretty resistant to Jesus' message. He's just done two miracles in front of them, and they say, Lord, we need a sign. They just have this this kind of ironic, funny moment where they're just not seeing it. And so Jesus preaches to the religious insiders a message from the book of Jonah, and he says this, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. This is the point that Jesus is making. The Ninevites turned... Uh, even though Jonah was this reluctant, not very good preacher, now someone greater than Jonah is here. I am greater than Jonah, and you're not hearing the message. You're not repenting. So the invitation in this text, I think, is for us to be open to the way God is inviting us to turn and live. How does God want to reshape our hearts in a new way towards the world around us. I I wonder, friends, what change, what transformation God might want to be about in our lives over the next 40 days, or in our church, or in the church in America. Perhaps at the end of it, we ought to just sit with this simple five-word sermon this week. 40 days, and you will be changed if we are open, if we will turn to the Lord. The good news of this text is that we have a God of second chances, a God of grace, and he doesn't want to leave us where we are. Like Jonah, he wants us to arise into a new calling, a new chapter like the Ninevites. He wants them to turn away from those ways that are destroying them and those around them. There's an invitation for us to experience great grace, and because of that grace, we can, in freedom and in confidence, acknowledge that we need God's help changing. We can humble ourselves before God, knowing that he wants to help us arise into a new season. Could we open ourselves up to that work today? Can we come before God and allow him to begin to shape our hearts? Because, friends, I believe that God wants to use us to begin to shape the culture around us in beautiful ways.
Rather than us being shaped by a culture that lacks grace, that lacks hope, he wants to send us as a light into a dark world. He commissions us to be messengers of reconciliation in a world that's growing divisive and polarized and violent. And that begins by allowing God to do that hapak, that transformation in our hearts. May we be open to the way God wants to change us as we receive his grace and his guidance. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this book of Scripture, and we thank you for your great patience and mercy. Lord, we acknowledge that there are ways that we have been out of step with your Spirit, ways that we've been more shaped by culture uh, than we like to maybe admit. And we thank you, Lord, that you uh, are a God of second chances and third chances and multiple chances that we can come before you and acknowledge our struggles. Would you do this deeper, transformative work in our hearts, Lord, that we might be a light in this dark world. As we come now to this table, we are reminded of the great lengths you went to save us, to help us remember the great gift of your sacrificial love for us. As we are nourished by your love and grace, may it Form us into gracious and loving people as we are sent out from this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.